Well, today on CMDA Matters, I have a repeat guest. In fact, this is his third time on the program. Reverend Stephen Coe, who listened to this, has MD, MA, MPH, and MDiv. And it's uh, not too long ago that I learned you could give him an M clown degree because he's actually <laughs> a professional clown. But uh, be that as it may, imagine he serves as senior pastor of New York Chinese Alliance Church in New York, New York. He's an ordained Christian and Missionary Alliance pastor. He's passionate about evangelism, global health missions, and because of that, he's spoken a couple of times at our CMDA Healthcare Leadership Missions Summit in Charlotte. Very interested in holistic ministry as exemplified by the life of Jesus Christ. In addition to seminary training, Dr. Coe's healthcare specialties include pediatrics, preventive medicine, and public health. He is currently adjunct professor at Alliance Theological Seminary. Previously, he also has been a global health professor at Boston University School of Public Health and served for some time as a medical officer for the CDC. He's worked extensively in Africa and Southeast Asia on diseases of epidemic potential, I believe including Ebola, helping low and middle income countries implement their national public health programs. He enjoys helping individuals flourish in their faith, and that includes mentoring church leaders and galvanizing faith-based organizations like CMDA to action. And with his writing, he really focuses at the intersection of faith, medicine, and public health. Well, Reverend Co, welcome to CMDA Matters. And it was just a little over a year ago that you sent me a copy of your Christianity Today article that a bad disease was coming our way and the church needs to get ready and make a difference. Welcome back today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Chupp. And uh, who would have thought that uh, a year later we would still be dealing with COVID today? But Thank you so much for this opportunity to weigh in. Well, let's jump right in. And by the way, I've got with me our senior vice president for bioethics and public policy, and uh, he's come on board since our first interviews uh, over a year ago. Welcome, Jeff. It's good to be here with you, Mike. Well, Jeff, of course, uh, those who've been listening know that Jeff has been following very closely, especially vaccine issues. Uh, Had a podcast just a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, talking about vaccine hesitancy. So Reverend Coe, uh, with all of that background and different perspectives, What have we learned in healthcare, uh, having gone now a year through this pandemic in the United States? Well, there's been extraordinary collaboration and partnerships advancing translational science. We've been able to turn observations in the community and clinic into interventions to improve the health of individuals and populations at an astounding speed. Multilateral, global, public-private partnerships have led to scientific advances in testing, treatment, and prevention, which includes, as you mentioned, vaccine development. Uh, When I first saw the movie Contagion, I laughed at how quick vaccines were produced and distributed. But today it's a reality. For the first time, we've developed vaccines against novel pathogens within a year of their discovery, about a tenth of the time it usually takes. And these nucleic acid vaccines which use a cell's existing infrastructure to manufacture defenses, are really poised to kickstart a golden era of rapid response vaccine development. But Mike, in contrast, the COVID pandemic has exposed underlying health and socioeconomic disparities, making existing gaps really more noticeable between resource rich and resource poor areas across the world and really within countries. We see fundamental inequalities in the healthcare system within access to knowledge and psychosocial determinants of health, which play a role in differing morbidity, mortality, and long-term sequelae from infections in various communities. We've talked in the past about all kinds of testing methods, and we've seen an incredible evolution of the way that we've tested for COVID-19. So as this pandemic continues, we hope certainly God willing, we get herd immunity and it, it, wow, praise God, the day we can say it's a thing in our rearview mirror. But do you think things like drive-through testing, are we gonna be seeing that in the future as sort of standard fare? Well, drive-through testing may be reserved for more infectious agents to limit contagion and the spread of disease. But 
really even pre-pandemic, large drugstore chains had already begun offering more point of care services within their pharmacies. Today, you can receive routine blood work or lab testing services at Walgreens through their partnership with LabCorp. And at certain CVS Minute clinic locations, you can see a healthcare provider in addition to obtaining laboratory testing and receiving prescriptions. Really, we already have at-home HIV kits and pregnancy tests. And I wonder how much more prevalent at-home testing will be in the future. The truth is the technology is already here, but it's quite different if you want to know if you're pregnant versus analyzing your own genetic testing results. Yeah. Stephen, as a, a physician and as a pastor, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think the church has done right and what have they done wrong during this pandemic? Collectively, churches have done a wonderful job modeling the love of Christ within their communities. Many have shuttered their doors to worship, but still opened their spaces for community outreach. We've seen churches transform into food distribution centers. Fellowship halls convert to makeshift vaccination clinics. And even as churches struggle, most have valiantly attempted to be the hands and feet of Christ to those with greatest needs in their neighborhood. But on the flip side, just as COVID has exposed underlying healthcare disparities, it has magnified the gap between existing houses of worship. While megachurches in suburban areas have been left largely unscathed by the pandemic, the vast majority of American churches are small, with a median size of 75 regular participants on a given Sunday morning. Megachurches have the resources and technical savvy to fine-tune their existing virtual services while adopting online ministries. But smaller churches have struggled to reach their congregations with an online presence while facing budgetary shortfalls, layoffs, and the threat of bankruptcy or permanent closure. Personally, I've seen several churches in New York City permanently close their doors mm. while dear friends and colleagues have left the pastorate. Mm. And with this shift to virtual ministry, I believe we have an existential crisis of worship that is leading to an erosion of faith among Christians. Research from the Barna Group shows that among practicing Christians, one in three admit to not worshiping online at all. And almost 30% of devoted Christians say they take advantage of online options on days other than Sunday. Through reimagining what church looks like, we've lost the ministry of presence, the sanctity of worship, and the meaning of Sabbath. Dr. Ko, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dr. Barrows and I were talking about misinformation regarding vaccines and about COVID-19 and how some of the mainstream media outlets have, have been really hard on evangelicals for maybe being a part of or partially to blame for spreading misinformation. From your perspective, is this valid criticism or is this, is this just a narrative that's coming from the prince of the power of the air to make the body of Christ, the bride of Christ look bad? Yeah, it's a delicate issue, uh, Dr. Shupp. Many of these evangelical leaders are pastoral colleagues, and I truly believe there is no ill intent or maleficence. However, generalized distrust of science and medicine has really become prevalent among Christians. In some ways, it's understandable given our overall response to the pandemic. This has resulted in a loss of credibility among federal institutions, such as the CDC, NIH, and FDA, and among scientists, doctors, and academics as well. Really, our, our church is no different than any others. Uh, if you take the issue of vaccine hesitancy, it's real among our congregation, especially the elderly. The majority were not comfortable receiving the vaccine, even when eligible. Questions abounded in regards to their safety and efficacy, whether they contained fetal issue, or if God was calling them to partake. And so it's really been a real and present danger, I think, within our community. And it's something that uh, we really have to lean into, uh, not only now, but in the future as well. Well, Stephen, I, I have heard from several of our members uh, kind of a 
a similar scenario that here we are a year into the pandemic and uh, as healthcare professionals, they're frustrated with their church leadership. Either the, the leadership has ignored putting out and, and, and following just common sense things like social distancing and masking and that type of thing. Or uh, even one, one physician uh, wrote me and said, you know, I've been a part of this church for many, many years, and my church leadership never came to me as, as a physician to ask my advice how to approach. So they're, they're in this church, they're seeing their church leadership completely ignore common sense things to protect the members of the congregation from this uh, virus. And and so uh, what advice would you give them moving forward as we come out of that and and as they try and deal with that frustration with their church leadership? Yeah, such an important issue moving forward. Uh, What we did to counter these issues was to marry science and theology. We provided clear and digestible information on vaccines as well as their potential side effects, such as anaphylaxis. Uh, We attempted to dispel false claims and rumors and answered questions in an open forum. The truth is sometimes you trust your pastor more than your doctor. And I think really the way forward is connecting theology and science, potentially uh, looking at a term that I call incarnational health. Uh, This extra biblical term, incarnation, signifies the hypostatic union between divinity and humanity. And identifying with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the concept of incarnational health allows us to embody what we believe as Christians. So by more fully understanding the incarnation of Christ, we embrace our union with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. According to Paul, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And through the reign of the Holy Spirit, we can live as Christ did on earth. Yet while we are to treat our bodies as temples of the Spirit of God, the death of Jesus demands a willingness to sacrifice everything for the sake of Christ, even when it leads to the cross. And so, Jeff, I think the way forward is really to sit down and think about not only issues of faith and theology, but to marry them to science and medicine as well. Well, as, as one individual, you represent that marriage in, in, in one professional. Uh, you're aware, Dr. Ko, and I just want to remind our listeners that, that that was one motivation for our partnership with Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Daryl Bach, who's the executive director of the Hendricks Center for Cultural Engagement, and the dialogues that we're trying to have, theologian on a panel, a, a physician, uh, Dr. Barrows has been a part of that, and certainly COVID-19 has been part of that discussion, but trying to have representatives, leaders, students, seminarians talking with physicians about the truth from both perspectives. I want to thank you for speaking out also and being someone who, who again, thinks about from both, both sides, both perspectives. Just a segue to vaccines. It seems like other countries, Israel certainly, and other countries, uh, U- I think it was UAE I saw, UK, many of the countries doing a much better job, very advanced in terms of vaccination. I'm assuming that you encourage everyone you talk to to get vaccinated. Um, Is that true? I'm assuming even if not at risk or low risk for contracting the virus. Absolutely. And I have a a good friend that's a physician and public health official in Israel, and uh, uh, they are really doing a fabulous job. You know, the numbers are astounding. But really, the three currently available vaccines are safe and effective, and through the accelerated pace of vaccine development may worry some. Let's not forget that vaccines are one of the greatest success stories of public health. Mm. Through the use of vaccines, we have eradicated smallpox and nearly eliminated polio. Smallpox eradication was in large part due to the efforts of ex-CDC director Bill Fagey son of a Lutheran minister who is inspired to engage in global health, secondary to his uncle, a Lutheran missionary in New Guinea. Mike, there's three reasons to be vaccinated now. Number one, to prevent COVID-19 infection. The mRNA vaccines are up to 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 disease. Number two, 
to build protection. Though getting COVID-19 may offer some natural protection, vaccination offers a much safer way to build immunity through immune responses. You know, COVID-19 vaccines in development were designed to prevent clinical infection and disease severity. The mRNA vaccines show the induction of an anamnestic immune response to the spike protein with a second dose and can generate high levels of neutralizing antibodies compared with a greater uh, number seen in the serum of normal patients. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> a bit about anamnestic response as a result of B lymphocytes recognizing T-dependent antigens during humoral immunity, numerous circulating B memory cells and T memory cells develop, which possess this memory. And so a subsequent exposure to that antigen results in more rapid production of antibodies. They're produced in greater amounts and produced for a longer time. And the third reason uh, really is that vaccines are the best tool to end the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It decreases the chance of family, friends, and church members from being infected. Uh, and when we have enough Americans uh, with immunity against COVID, we can stop its spread and achieve uh, this concept of herd immunity. Well, Stephen, with your background in epidemiology, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any observations about how our government have distributed uh, the vaccines and prioritized various populations. And I know that Christians tend to get a little uncomfortable when you bring up the topic of of resource allocation, and, and we've had a statement we've released on that here at CMDA, but I, I'd be curious as to your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I'll start with the scriptures, Dr. Barrows. Uh, time and time again, God shows compassion to the poor, the poor, the homeless, the orphans, and the widows. In Exodus 22, Moses cautions the Israelites not to take advantage of the widows or the orphans. Mm. In Leviticus 19.10, he teaches them to leave the fallen fruits of the vineyards to the poor and alien. In fact, every three years, they are to bring the year's produce and store it in the towns of the Levites, aliens and fatherless and widows among them. And the vigorous defense of the marginalized really shows how much God despises inequality. Perhaps the fiercest indictment comes from Jesus himself when he says, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. So with these scriptures in mind, I say there are several issues to consider for resource allocation. Number one, as you're well aware of, beneficence. And that's how we can do the most good for the most people. A second uh, would be fairness. It really shouldn't matter if you're rich or poor, what ethnicity you are, or where you reside. All life is sacred to the Father, and we must value everyone. And number three, uh, the issue of equity. How do we deal with the unequitable distribution of diseases among different populations? Black and Latinos have four to five times higher rates of hospitalization. Rural areas have less access to acute and critical care. And as we all know by now, 80% of deaths occur in elderly over 65, while 40% are those residing in assisted living and nursing homes. Well, Stephen, I was on the phone yesterday with a mutual friend of ours who's the chairwoman of the CMDA New York City chapter uh, there, Dr. Paulina Kim. And uh, we were talking, she mentioned, you know, Mike, a, a recent occurrence has been a knowledge of a New York City variant of COVID-19 that people are very concerned about. And I thought it was, uh, the timing was interesting that we would be discussing this topic this morning. What do you know about this New York City variant? You know, New York City got hit, boom, you guys were in the, the epicenter for the COVID-19. And now it seems like the discussion again is back to New York City and this variant. What can you tell us about it? Yeah, very interesting science uh, for any one of our members that's interested. Uh, Dr. David Ho did this presentation and he's really a renowned virologist. But, you know, really, there are several different variants uh, out there right now. You know, there's a B117 uh, UK variant. 
There's the B1351 South African one and the B1128 Brazilian variant. And so there are and will be additional variants in the future, but yet I believe there is still a light at the end of the tunnel. The current vaccines uh, appear to be effective enough to end the pandemic. Uh, they're certainly concerned that the growing number of COVID variants, including the New York City one, can negatively impact the vaccinations. But really, uh, none of the ones that we see now, they lower vaccine protection to some extent. But uh, you know, if we want to go a little bit deeper, much of vaccine research has focused on antibody response to the virus's spike protein. But really, our immune system has other mechanisms which are mobilized by the current COVID vaccines. This includes specifically T cells, which attack infected cells that the virus hijacks, and antibodies that target the virus in places other than the spike protein. And so, you know, no matter which variant you're talking about, so far, research seems to show that the variants don't really affect T cell immunity much. T cells are as effective in recognizing the variants as the original virus. This means we have different mechanisms within the current crop of vaccines to provide protection against current and potentially future variants. Mike, even if the vaccine effectiveness falls to, say, 60%, we still have a path to herd immunity. Realistically, more people will likely need to be vaccinated if that effectiveness decreases. Instead of 50 to 60% of the population needing to be vaccinated with highly effective vaccines, we may need 80 to 90% of the population if that effectiveness decreases. But you know, if you were to look into the future a little bit, Mike and Jeff, maybe the future of coronas, coronavirus vaccines is targeting more stable regions of the coronavirus instead of the spike proteins, which are really more prone to mutations. You know, for example, I think uh, scientists in the University of Nottingham are testing a vaccine candidate targeting both the spike protein as well as the nucleocapsid, which is far less likely to mutate. And uh, I believe Caltech researchers have already engineered a prototype all-in-one vaccine using a nanoparticle holding fragments of spike proteins from multiple known coronaviruses. This approach may provide protection, not just for COVID-19, but for a variety of coronaviruses, including emerging ones in the future. That's a lot to swallow. <laughs> yeah, but but hopeful, but yeah. hopeful. Yes. It, it is. So Stephen is a pastor of a large church there in New York City. How is your church doing now compared to a year ago? And what do you think the greatest challenges for pastors like yourself and other church leaders here a year into the pandemic? Personally, there's a, tremendous sense of peace knowing that God is sovereign over all. And I take great solace in the words of Paul in Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. It's certainly been one of the most challenging seasons for all churches, including our own. From closing in the spring of 2020 to reopening in the fall, there's a palpable sense of anxiety and exhaustion for a majority of our church. Some have lost their jobs. Others are navigating full-time work from home and full-time online school for their kids. Many have become ill during the season, and we've lost a number of congregants to COVID. Really, the greatest challenge is how to minister to broken people during an existential crisis of worship. Online worship is novel, creative, and enticing, but the church was never meant to be, or was really always meant to be an engaged community of believers devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. Online ministry helps in some ways, but it will never replace worship with brothers and sisters or a hearty meal in the presence of believers. 
And that's why the author of Hebrews exhorts us to not give up gathering together. The good news is that most practicing Christians understand this. Pew Research affirms it with 92% of regular attendees expecting that post-pandemic, they will attend physical services at least as often as they did in the past. Mm. So if you could pray for us, we desperately need wisdom and how to navigate and minister in the season as we move towards a time post-pandemic. I think all of our listeners would agree we need to be praying more than ever for our pastors and for wisdom as this pandemic uh, continues. And we're hoping there's an end in sight. Reverend Dr. Ko, you know, I'm not going to hold you to a standard of an Old Testament prophet where if you're wrong, you know, we would have to stone you. But, <laughs> but is there an uh, what do you think? When is the end coming in terms of when we might be out of this with herd immunity and have some semblance of looking in the rearview mirror. Yeah, it's really exciting that uh, we may have enough uh, vaccine for the adult population by the end of May or early summer. And so, you know, a few limiting factors would be how fast can the general population uh, obtain the vaccine? And then, you know, there's the question that we talked about a little bit, which is the issue of variants, which uh, impacts uh, the number needed to obtain vaccination and uh, obtain herd immunity. But, you know, if I were to be cautiously optimistic, you know, looking towards the end of the year, you know, I'd be very hopeful to see, uh, you know, getting back to uh, some semblance of normalcy. One question I wanted to ask, and you can answer it in the best uh, best way you feel, or you can refuse to answer it altogether, <laughs> altogether, Stephen. But you know, we get a fair amount of inquiry. Jeff and I do regarding treatment of mild and moderate cases of COVID nineteen with drugs like uh, you know, been somewhat controversial throughout hydroxychloroquine and another one, ivermectin. What are you seeing as treatments for ambulatory patients with milder cases? It's been a tough area, and I, I really can empathize with uh, clinicians that are on the front lines, uh, our primary care doctors who uh, face COVID and uh, don't really have a lot of tools at their disposal. You know, I think if you look back at the year, uh, it's no doubt that there's been a lot of research and development for those that are sickest among us, you know, with moderate and severe disease that are you know, really most at risk at severe morbidity and mortality. And so you see a lot of these tools that we can use within our ICUs now, you know, whether it's plasma, antibodies, uh, uh, remdesivir, et cetera. But, you know, I completely agree. There has been sort of a paucity of uh, available treatment options, especially at the other end of the spectrum. And so I, I would fully expect with time uh, that uh, there would be more. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that research has been done on the, the top side, but uh, you do see some new treatments. Uh, in fact, uh, monoclonal antibodies that can even be given for uh, moderate and mild patients now, although you do need an infusion suite. Well, as we close the podcast, I'd like to close on a, maybe a, a personal interest note, a lighter side of things. For our listeners, Reverend Ko is the only preacher that I know who doubles also as a professional clown. I think I mentioned that in the in the intro. So, how did you get interested in how did you beco- <laughs> how did you become Coco the clown? Yeah, uh, you know, we certainly need uh, the medicine of laughter today more than ever. Amen. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> you know that that's a story that started in high school, and we had a, a church uh, carnival. Uh, as an outreach event. And so my mother, who was in charge, invited one of her friends who happened to be a clown. Mm. And he brought an extra suit with him. And uh, he asked all the kids uh, and the youth uh, if anyone would be uh, willing to don the suit. Thinking that everyone would be interested, I, I rushed to the front of the line and raised my hand, only to look back and find that I was the only one <laughs> that was excited. And so I donned the suit, and that was the beginning of uh, Coco the Clown. Uh, since then, had an opportunity to uh, go to clown school, 
and say, I dare say that my clown diploma is worth more than my medical one. <laughs> but it's uh, certainly uh, the medicine of laughter, as I mentioned, is, is definitely needed. And uh, the theology of laughter is something maybe we can talk about it at a different time. They give out clown diplomas then, huh? Amen. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Reverend Dr. Ko, for joining us again today and uh, for, for sharing with us from different perspectives on, on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we pray from CMDA that God will continue to bless your ministry and your influence in that marriage of theology and, and medicine from here on out. And thanks for reminding us of that scripture from Colossians that uh, Paul shared with us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Mike and Jeff, and we'll be praying for CMDA and uh, your role as we end the pandemic. Well, I'm guessing that some of you remember, like me, the late actor, Mr. Robin Williams, and the role that he played in that movie, Patch Adams. And that's immediately what I thought of as Dr. Ko, a pediatrician, described his alter ego as Coco the Clown. I'm so grateful to God that he allowed the paths of Reverend Ko and CMDA to cross a couple of years before this pandemic began. He's been a great resource for us at CMDA, appearing three times on CMDA Matters over the past year as we've gone through this COVID-19 pandemic and healthcare crisis together. I'm quite sure that his Chinese Missionary Alliance congregation in New York City is most grateful that they have a shepherd like him during the COVID-19 outbreak. Well, in light of the crisis of the past year, I want to invite you to join us for the CMDA Virtual National Convention under the theme, Courage Through the Crisis, Stories from the Front Lines. This event will include lectures by notable speakers, as well as breakout sessions during which you will have the opportunity to fellowship with like-minded healthcare professionals. Some of our speakers will include Reverend Albert Moeller, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, who, by the way, will be my guest just a few weeks from now on this podcast. Also, best-selling author Philip Yancey, who was my guest last week on the program. Dr. Alveda King, niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., will also be joining us in an interview with yours truly. And then Reverend and author Burt Jones, who co-authored the book entitled Leadership Proverbs. He will be our Bible teacher throughout the virtual national convention. To register for our convention, just go to cmda.org slash events where the national convention and other upcoming events are posted for CMDA. I am thrilled to let you know that we at CMDA are working on a brand new training program on how to effectively live out and share your faith in a medical or dental or physician assistant or nurse practitioner or physiotherapist or optometry or you name it, any healthcare practice. Many of you will remember that CMDA produced a course in the mid 90s that we called the Saline Solution. And that was followed about 20 years later by Grace Prescriptions. Both of those programs were produced by Dr. Walt Laramore and Reverend Bill Peel. Well, for many of us followers of Christ in Healthcare, we finally had a curriculum that taught us how to do spiritual interventions and ministry with our patients. Well, welcome to a new generation and we're calling the new curriculum Faith prescriptions. It consists of 24 videos of 15 to 20 minute duration on various practical topics such as spiritual interventions, praying with your patients, ethical and legal implications of sharing your faith, another keeping it natural, and then overcoming obstacles to the gospel and so many other topics. Within each of these videos we plan to include two to three shorter videos from our CMDA members across the country like you. So if you'd like an opportunity to be part of this new video teaching series, please submit your video to us as soon as you can. These videos or brief cameos as I call them can be recorded with a phone or a computer and should be shot horizontally showing just the upper body 
only about 30 to 45 seconds in length. The topic should be something related to spiritual interactions or ministry with your patients in healthcare. Maybe a principle that you have found helpful, or maybe an example of a patient or colleague to whom you have ministered. When you finish your quick video testimony, just email Dr. Bill Griffin, our Vice President of Dental Ministry at cda, cda at cmda.org. And he will send you a link allowing you to share your video with us and possibly find yourself as part of this up and coming training series. I want to thank you today for listening to this week's CMDA Matters podcast. Next week, my featured guest is author Dr. Carl Truman, who wrote our featured book this month, the title, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution. For podcast listeners, we are making this limited time offer. Just go to cmda.org slash rise and triumph, one word, rise and triumph, and click on give now. And we will then send you a copy of Dr. Truman's book. You will see Matters 2103 book offer automatically in the ministry field of that donation page. Thank you so much in advance for your gift to the Ministry of Changing Hearts in Healthcare. This book by Professor Truman, which has been dubbed by many as the book of the year, if not the book of the decade, for the church interacting with culture. It opens so many windows of understanding on the sexual and moral revolution that we find ourselves in today. Well, that wraps it up for this program today. So until next week, please don't forget that what matters to you matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. We'll see you next week, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.